Tom is going to tell us what CEOs look for in today's CMO. So ladies and gentlemen, Tom Seklo. everybody. Hey. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Tom Seklo. Very good. Got my pronunciation right. Um, I lead the marketing officer practice for Spencer Stewart. And, and the perspective I'm going to share with you about what CEOs look for in CMOs comes from um, <clears throat> the work we do in placing marketing executives, mostly CMOs, but sometimes people who report to CMOs across different industry sectors. So we do work in financial services, in consumer, in life sciences, and of course, in technology. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the video I just showed is, shows a, quite a few of the challenges that go on uh, that I think you are all experienced with and face. There's also a lot of good news in being a marketer these days. Um, one of the most press-worthy things is CMO tenure. It was referenced in the video. And um, <clears throat> we at Spencer Stewart have been keeping track of this for a number of years. And it, it is, I think it's press-worthy in part because it's shorter than other uh, C-suite C officers. Um, but it has doubled as you can see, and uh, we're, we're seeing it continuing to grow um, in certain sectors. The reason behind that is a lot to do with data and analytics, that um, <clears throat> CMOs who have data and analytics uh, lends credibility to their jobs and it also extends their longevity. And, and you don't see it in this data, but in some of the sub-functional areas or industry areas, particularly automotive, retail, and fast food restaurants, the tenure is shorter. And I think that largely links to the fact that advertising, traditional advertising, uh, which is far more subjective, is one of the key uh, use of media in those businesses, and therefore um, <clears throat> they're a little more vulnerable. Um, we're also seeing that the roles of CMOs are building. Uh, there are, I'm gonna give you a couple examples. We call them CMO Plus in, in our vernacular, Spencer Stewart. And these are CMOs who've picked up additional responsibility. So Clive Serkin, who's the uh, chief growth officer at Kellogg, <coughs> has sales and marketing, which is pretty unusual in a CPG company. Sales has always been separate. He has both. There are a few other examples. Joe Tripati at Coke had that before. He does it at Subway. Um, Clive's background was he was in the ad agency, ad agency business, and then he was the CMO of uh, Kimberly Clark before Kellogg. Antonio Lucio, who's in the valley here, um, he has, his title is CMO and uh, Chief Marketing Officer and Communications. Um, before he was at HP, Antonio was the CMO of Visa, and this is kind of unusual, he was given HR and strategy as part of his job there. His background prior was um, at PepsiCo. And then Marty St. George, Marty is a, is a marketer, 
his title is a little confusing. He's EVP of commercial and planning at JetBlue. He has all revenue at JetBlue. He's got sales, marketing, he's got cargo, he's got international. Um, <clears throat> and he has what's called revenue management, which is the pricing. So these are some examples of uh, marketers who have uh, extended marketing beyond just what's traditionally thought of at the marketing role. And we are seeing more of that. The other nice indicator is boards. Uh, marketers are being recruited onto boards. These are public company boards. Now this is a tiny, tiny number, all right? So of Fortune 1000 companies, there are approximately 9,900 board seats, okay? There are 53 that are occupied by CMOs or former CMOs. A little deceptive, because there are some CEOs who came up the marketing ranks, so they're former CMOs. Um, my reference here is CMOs who, who, who finished their, their careers as CMOs. Um, we are seeing more of this. We have several mandates right now where we're recruiting some. And the reason for that is that marketers are seen as having an understanding of the customer or the consumer and visibility, some strategy. Um, also, they are seen as offering uh, digital insights and having digital acumen as some of the only board members that do. Average age of uh, Fortune 1000 is like 63. So this also brings down age and for a lot of the people we're putting on boards and adds um, diversity, mostly women that we're putting on boards. So that's all good news about what we're seeing as part of the evolution of marketing. There, there still are some challenges. Um, <clears throat> one of them is the expectations and the expectations that you can measure everything. Uh, there's recognition that data can measure all sorts of things. Uh, sometimes it can, sometimes it can't. Uh, part of CMO's role is also to understand the customer really well and uncover ahas that link to brand and the content that you create and creative messaging and all that work. Um, <clears throat> that is, is not just driven by data. Uh, Gary Briggs at uh, Facebook has a funny way of saying it. He says, you can't take an algorithm to lunch. So it's like, and also data isn't always right. Um, uh, who would have predicted Trump most people did not predict Trump based on data in November. Um, <clears throat> you're also expected to move quickly while balancing the short and long term. Um, you see a lot of signs up in hallways about fail fast, fail quickly, and, and you have tools as marketers to be able to test things, which is very cool. You can learn quickly and rapid cycles and make changes. The pace in public companies can be staggering because you also have to make quarterly numbers. And if you're doing lead gen and conversion, you know the pressures on that. At the same time, you are tasked with building brands very often. And building brands and nurturing brands is not something that is done quarter to quarter, but takes you know, years to do that. And lastly, you're expected to do more with less. I think a lot in the executives that we talk to in the C-suite expect marketers um, to do more with less because of uh, digital and social media and so forth that you know, you're not gonna be doing Super Bowl ads or putting your names on stadiums, so you're gonna save a whole boatload full of money. Well, the activities that you're doing to replace those, if you ever were doing those sorts of things, do cost money. If you're creating custom content, if you're doing events, they want bigger, better events, and the agencies to put those on, and the people in your own organizations to support those. So that was kind of a review of sort of the best of time, worst of time sort of thing for marketers. And on the whole, I think it's very positive. We are seeing marketers elevated in organizations. I, I, I wanna talk now a little bit about um, four observations that we've had uh, that emerge from our discussions with CEOs and, and, and other C-suite members when we do work. And then I, I wanna tie that um, to you as marketers and, and how that relates to your roles. So the first point is alignment and understanding where marketing fits in your organization. And this is typically where people uh, <clears throat> fall off alignment with their CEOs, with their bosses. And when we get called in for private conversations about replacing somebody, it's usually that the marketer was out of sync with what the CEO was looking to do and the rest of the C-suite. And <clears throat> this values, the, the marketing is valued very differently by organization um, and by industry. So I think one of the ways you can quickly tell industry to industry is look at who the leaders are. Look at the bios. So if you look at the banking business, there are no marketers running banking. They all come up loan officers. In retail, the leaders of retail organizations by and large are merchants. Um, <clears throat> if you look at in, in hospitality and leisure, 
restaurants, hotels, cruise lines, all the leaders, the top executives come out of operations of those organizations. And in technology, it's largely the product and engineering people. So you have to understand that the lens that they see marketing with is from whatever functional area that they came up with. <coughs> and th that's really important in understanding what they're gonna look for in a marketer. <coughs> and um, I wanna share with you one of the things that we do. This is a tool we use. Uh, I won't go through each of the boxes on here, but we sit down with the CEOs and we discuss um, what really matters in your organization. And we have, we call this our nine box thingy because we haven't gotten a better name for it. We do have slight variations on this by industry. So we change some of the boxes somewhat, but you can see what they are. I mean, and these are all part of the marketing officer task. And nine times out of 10, the CEO will start the conversation with something along the lines of, <clears throat> we know our business really well, but we don't know marketing, okay? And this is with the other C-suite members. And then we, we bring this out and we start digging in to understand what part of marketing are you looking to fix? What do you wanna do with this new hire? And how does it relate to what your business needs are? And they look at this and usually the first answer is all of them. And they, they kind of laugh at that and they're like, mm, well, no, really, what do you want? And I think part of that's a misconception about marketing. This is gone on very long time where there's a belief that marketing is, you know, sprinkle some magic fairy dust or, you know, I want the guy who named sushi instead of cold dead fish, you know, that sort of thing where they, they magically turn the business by doing a logo or something kind of cool. And that, as you all know, that's not what marketing is. And marketing has a lot of functions and they've become more complex. So digging in and understanding what those are <clears throat> is what's important in defining the role. Um, as importantly, I'll get to this in a minute, but for the marketer, for the hire, they have to be able to understand what those are too and evangelize kind of regularly about what it is they're going to do in the organization. So for example, if they are tasked with, um, I can barely read these on here, uh, people in leadership, that's building the marketing function, all right? Uh, if that's a priority, if the marketing function is not um, healthy and there isn't bench strength, and certainly compared to other functional organizations within the company, like the CFO or the CIO or general counsel, then that's something you can measure. You measure you know, the people who are hired and their contributions. If it's about strategy and, and so forth, I think you get the idea there. The next point I wanna talk about is understanding uh, how your customers or consumers think. This is kind of the holy grail for all CMOs and it's what's empowered CMOs to do more in the organization to, to, and to get on boards. <clears throat> and it's, it's, um, it's fueled by a lot of data and analytics. It's also uh, recognizing that what a marketer can do by having, being the advocate for the customer inside the organization is very powerful. Um, they can <clears throat> see around corners, presumably. Sometimes they get involved in M&A and corporate development, which makes sense as an extension of where the business is going. Uh, one of the other things that we are seeing is this rise of the chief experience officer. This is particularly in services businesses. Um, we see it in hospitality and leisure, retail, and, and in uh, financial services. These executives are, sometimes they report to CMOs, sometimes they don't, and they are focused on the customer experience, and that's called the customer journey. Um, for example, I rented a car a couple weeks ago and I was at the airport and it occurred to me when the person was asking me behind the counter, do I want the fuel option? They do not know about, I mean, that is not for me as a customer, that's for them. That's because it's difficult to get the cars refueled back at, you know, that's a whole thing. And to win in this marketplace, differentiating yourself on customer experience is becoming more and more important. What those executives tend to do is an internal function. So they break down the barriers, often operationally, in that example, you know, it would be whatever the challenges are of getting cars refueled so they don't pin it on the consumer. But <clears throat> consumers have much more power. And you know what? I'm going to Uber next time. <laughs> uh, I do most of the time anyway. But it, it's just like they don't get that. And then they're, they're, they're going to have to because the, the consumer is, is king. Um, one of the pitfalls and where people come off is <clears throat> believing, particularly in organizations that are not particularly marketing driven, but where you have internal clients to serve, whether it's sales or engineering, that you are focused on delivering to that client and take your eye off the ball of what the, the consumer or customer wants in the end. 
to elevate and to be successful as a marketer, I believe you have to have, always have to have the customer, the consumer in mind, the end consumer. Even if your goal is to deliver you know, qualified leads to the sales guys tomorrow, you still have to understand, okay, where are those gonna come from? What are the right segments? And be able to communicate that. And that's how you gain influence in the organization. The next part I wanna talk about is understanding an organizational culture. Um, <clears throat> Culture has been around since companies have been around. It's become very vogue in conversation, probably in the last four or five years. I, I think the reason for that is that the pace of business is changing so rapidly that you can't constantly be hiring for new skills and uh, specialties. You need to hire for a team that's going to be able to adapt and learn those things, be able to hire outside when you need it. Um, <clears throat> We at Spencer Stewart have uh, a tool that I'll tell you about in a second. I'm sure there are plenty of other ones out there. Um, Glassdoor is a terrific way to look at uh, something about a company culture, but understanding your fit with a company is very important. It's become more important just because of the pressures on business and friction inside, natural friction that takes place because of transformation that's going on in organizations. Um, the cultural tool we use, we use it to use it for our clients. We also use it to hire people for ourselves now. And I'll take you through this real quickly. Um, there are two axes here. One is independence and then it's interdependence. And when I'm with independence is working alone, interdependence is working through teams and people. And then on the top and bottom, there's flexibility and stability. So those are the two axes. We've, and then we've got uh, different style profiles, we call them, which are these circles around the around the periphery here. Um, and I'm gonna give you some examples of companies and their cultures. Uh, I'm gonna come over here and view this because my eyes aren't so good. Um, this is from Amazon. Our culture is friendly intense, but if push comes to shove, we'll settle for intense. <laughs> GlaxoSmith Klein. I've tried to keep us focused on a very, these come from the CEOs, a very clear strategy of modernizing ourselves. And you can see these line up more on authority and results end of the spectrum. Okay, moving up toward independent, interdependence, I'm sorry, independence and enjoyment. Zappos, have fun. The game is a lot more enjoyable when you're trying to do more than make money. Apple, it's better to be a pirate than join the Navy. <laughs> Whole Foods, now I realize Whole Foods is part of Amazon. It'll be very interesting to see. I mean, I think that, that's the most interesting part of that is their two cultures are very different. Uh, both customer-centric and customer-focused, but their internal cultures are completely different. This is a quote from their CEO. I believe that it's not, uh, I believe it's the, I can't read that. All right. <laughs> Another example is Disney. So Whole Foods, by the way, is up in the purpose corner, and we do see there are a lot of purpose and mission-driven kind of organizations that people are attracted to, particularly marketers. Marketers will make moves for companies. Um, they are more intellectually curious, uh, maybe career promiscuous, and will go toward different things uh, just because they're drawn to it. And sometimes it's not even for money or location or other things other than they want to be making a difference. And we're seeing that more with millennials, younger people coming in the business who want to do things that are mission-based. Mission uh, CMOs for uh, healthcare businesses, uh, education, and, and believe it or not, dating services where they see there's like a, a higher calling for what their output is rather than just sales and numbers that they're helping people find mates for life. Marsk is a huge um, shipping line. You have probably seen their ships around. Uh, it's not a surprise that they come down in toward the order and safety end. And last on here is the Federal Reserve. Okay, but I think you get the idea of what this is. And the important part is understanding where you fit and um, on, the, on the cultural scale. The way we do this is we do this among our client organization, get a baseline, and then each candidate that comes through uh, as part of our search, they take an online, it's an online survey, it takes about 15 minutes and captures what's important to them, and they get a little, you see where you line up on there, um, and we, we match that. One of the things that's interesting is, I thought when we first started doing this, that our clients would want people who match their culture. By and large, they don't. They, most of them are trying to shift their culture. One, I'm showing you some extremes of companies that have very pronounced cultures. <clears throat> but a lot of companies are going through change, um, and they're looking for people. It's very hard to change a culture. It takes years and years. But if you're seating to people at the top of the house, 
in this case usually it's chief marketing officers, it can help with that progression. The last slide I want to leave with you, <clears throat> leave you with is about knowing your superpower. I've just walked through a lot of the complexity of being a marketer today. Um, it is not an easy job. There is a lot of technology involved. There's a lot of art and the creative part of it, leading agencies, leading people. I think one of the most important things is you can't possibly have all this inside of you. So if you know your superpower, if you know what you're really good at, you can support yourself and find people to compliment you. Um, <clears throat> for example, if you're really good on vision and strategy, chances are you're less good on details. Um, if you're really great on analytics and data, very often you're not as good on creative. So you have to find people to compliment you. I give a presentation on this topic um, at, at business schools at, at uh, Haas and uh, Yale each year. <clears throat> and when I talk about this part, a lot of the students um, interpret it wrong. They think, okay, I don't like to do whatever, therefore I shouldn't do it and I find somebody else to do it for me. And that's not exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying to be an effective leader, you've got to be able to play all the keys on the piano and if you can't, you've got to find somebody to be able to do it and know how to lead them to doing that sort of thing. Okay? And that is my presentation. Thank you.